we're really pleased that Anka Hanover joined us in, in developing this, this new guidance. I'm pleased that uh, Sarah Jones, who's the Chief Financial Officer at Anka Hanover, was able to join us today. So welcome, Sarah. And I think you've got a few words about, um, about, the, um, about the report for us. I do indeed. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, I'm very impressed by the build-up. I feel like I should have had walk-on music. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really, really great. Um, and I'm also really delighted to um, have the opportunity to be with you and Mark the um, publication of, of this important report. Um, and we at Anchor were really keen to sponsor it because we recognise that people's housing and care needs change over time. And it's by no means just specialist providers, housing providers like us that um, need to ensure our homes can adapt to reflect those uh, changes. So a little bit about Anchor, for those of you that don't know, we're, we're England's largest not-for-profit provider of housing and care to older people. Uh, we provide services to more than 65,000 residents in almost 54,000 um, homes of different tenures almost exclusively in England, and we have services in more than 85% of local authorities across England. Um, now, we say that we focus on services for older people, and we do, but of course that group is enormously varied, ranging from people who are 55, which is the historic definition of an older person, um, up to those who are well over 100. And of course, within that group, we have people who are fit and active and independent, as well as many who might have physical challenges, and of course, those who are living with dementia. At the age profile of the housing association sector generally is weighted towards the higher end of the scale compared to the general public. Um, but of course, as we know, age isn't always a reliable indicator of frailty. In fact, some of Anchor's oldest residents are living in our independent housing rather than our um, care homes. So a little bit more about the sector, which obviously you'll know very well. We know that there is a lack of appropriate accommodation for uh, both disabled people and those living in later life. Um, and when we look at the older people's housing market, which is what we specialise in, um, you can see that over the last decade, only about 7,000 new units of retirement housing have been built each year. Um, and our, re our research has found that 4 million people over the age of 65 say that they would consider re re uh, retirement housing as an option. Um, if you look at the sector as a whole, there are only 720,000 specialist retirement homes in the UK, um, and only 0.6% of over 65 live in that specialist housing. So you can see there is a huge, a huge uh, demand there, latent demand. So for that reason, developing specialist housing and adapting existing homes absolutely aren't competition for each other. Uh, both are really necessary because the demand for the services and the support absolutely outstrips supply. So our focus has got to be on um, enabling people to have a choice. So appropriate accommodation should be adapted to meet people's needs and that can help people stay safe and secure and independent uh, for longer. Um, also supporting positive health outcomes and supporting people to stay connected with their communities, which is obviously so important for them. Right now, it's time for the guest. Oh, <laughs> another build up. <laughs> um, or is that that I've been speaking for too long? Hopefully not. No. The foundation's research comes at a, a very appropriate time. Um, it follows um, Anchor's own uh, report that came out last week, uh, which is called, about, called Fragmented UK. Um, and that, interesting, found a real disparity in expectations, depending on which uh, generation you're speaking to. So the expectations amongst older people and the perceptions of younger people, of what older people would want. So we found that um, over 50 percent of 18 to 34 year olds are, are making an assumption that their parents or a close family member would, would want them to provide care in, in, in later life. But actually only 16% of the over 55 say that they would want their children or their close family member to provide that care. So there's a real sort of disconnect there. Um, there's also a lack of awareness about the options that are available to older people. Um, so only we found only 20% of respondents said that they understand the options available to them and more than a third have limited or no understanding of the options available to, to them. And of course, we've already said that actually the options are that are available don't meet that demand. They, they, the capacity isn't there at the moment. Um, one of the other things that the research highlighted was um, exactly what independence means to older people. And 
so how that would uh, what, what what that would mean to them if to to be independent what would it take for them to feel independent and amongst the top answers of course was living in their own home and being able to pursue their current way of living that's really important to people so that's one of the reasons we're really keen to uh, support this report and to encourage a national conversation around this topic um, we want people to feel able to speak to friends and relatives to discuss how they want to live in later life um, so that people can pro make proactive decisions um, and, and ch choose that lifestyle and choose a lifestyle that will support them to be um, happy and uh, independent in later life for longer, rather than have those decisions um, having to be made in a crisis at a later stage. Um, and as providers, we can obviously play a really important role in informing those conversations. And um, I'm confident that many of the recommendations in this report can help us to achieve that. So um, I think that's uh, all I'd, I'd like to say, but I'm really interested now to uh, hear from the writers of the report. Great. Th thank you, Sarah. And um, I, I think, can you, can you pass on my thanks to, to Mario as well, actually, because um, kind of part of the serendipity of getting this report together was that um, myself and Mario went to a meeting and uh, we both got lost trying to find the meeting room and actually kind of the conversation while we were getting to lost while we were getting lost actually led to the, to this report so uh, it's kind of one of those nice serendipitous things that uh, kind of happened before lockdown yes <laughs> so great and, and thank, for, thank you very much Dan kind of supporting it's, it's very much appreciated very much appreciated so um thank you Sarah 